for the gifts that we have to give and for this community that truly seeks to live out its covenant, that love is the spirit of this church and service is its law, may we be grateful. Today's second reading is a quote from Selena, the movie. Japanese Americans, Italian Americans, German Americans, their homeland is on the other side of the ocean. Ours is right next door, right over there. And we got to prove to the Mexicans how Mexican we are, and we got to prove to the Americans how American we are. We got to be more Mexican than the Mexicans and more American than the Americans, both at the same time. It's exhausting. Damn. Nobody knows how tough it is to be a Mexican American. <sighs> Good morning. I invite you to take a deep breath with me because I need it. <laughs> and let it out. This is a very hard service for me to do. I thought it was going to be easier. <laughs> I can get really excited about challenging things. And when I first signed up to lead this service today, many months ago, I had written in the service planner the words, crossing back. Because it was a theme building up in my life around the headscarf and removing it and how difficult it was to cross back into spaces that have only known me by that identity. Meadville Lombard Theological School readings and reflections, UUI, all have played a major role in that. And I had some idea in my head of what this would be about. There I put notes, noting that this service also needed to incorporate a touch on Father's Day today, World Refugee Day, which is on June 20th, Summer Solstice, and the month of Ramadan, of holy fasting that has been ongoing this month with the celebration of Eid al-Adha, or the festival of sacrifice that is to occur on June 25th. This is my way of speaking and sharing, to create a synthesis out of different things that may appear not to go together or seem impossible to get together in 20 minutes. However, it's always important for me to connect meaning to the things that I share because I need to speak from a place of authenticity. So inside of me, I had hoped that before today I would achieve a deeper connection to the service. And that happened. And it happened in a way that I haven't enjoyed. I've spent the last four to five weeks in a state of fear, anxiety, and frustration. I've cried a lot, been unable to concentrate or sleep well, and at times overslept to avoid feeling some of this. I have been bitter for so much time that I have lost. I have been bitter that I did not get to spend more time focusing on my eighth graders' graduation from the School for Community Learning here on UUI's campus. He is my first child who I had the great pleasure to homeschool up until two years ago, my first child to go to high school this year. I have been bitter that I did not have the opportunity to spend more time with him, preparing him for his first out-of-continent experience. Currently, him and other 7th and 8th graders, along with parents and guardians, are on a trip to Germany. And they just finished their visit to the Czech Republic. A huge experience for him and his father, and I was split in having to share time for that work and this issue that needed resolving. During this time, I've had moments of deeply questioning my resilience. Did I really have it in me to accomplish the task at hand, on time, or at least near time. I've had the opportunity before to share parts of my own border crossing, which is something we speak of, speak of often in Unitarian Universalism. When we speak of going beyond our comfort zones, to go to a protest, to be curious, to listen to other people's stories, all of that is crossing borders, and you and I have crossed many. Some literal geographical borders, some new spaces that we've come into whether it is this congregation or previous religious communities that we've come from. I, for example, grew up Catholic, and I've crossed into the Muslim community, into Islam, into mosques. I've also crossed into Buddhism and UU and UUI. 
Coming here to Indiana from California was a border crossing. Going to Black Lives Matter protests, watching videos, and staying connected to the issues of police brutality with people of color, all of that is border crossing for me and for most of you. There are lots of ways in which we border cross. I literally cross the border to get into Mexico while in my mother's womb. Because although I was supposed to be born in San Diego, when my father lost his job and was told to leave his home by his landlord, he crossed the border, which for him was a crossing back experience, because it was a place he knew and had resources in. He didn't know what crossing the border would mean for all of our lives, and he didn't know what it would mean for mine. As an infant, I literally crossed back across the border in the arms of my father, while my mom crossed back, already pregnant, with my brother, who had the privilege of being born in San Diego, and automatically received protections and acknowledgement of his existence. He had a clearly defined home and the blessing to be here. My dad has apologized to me many times for not knowing any better, in his own words. Of course, a translation from the Spanish. And in the past few weeks, he's re-apologized, just as my mom has. I have listened and told him that there's no need to apologize for the choices they only knew they had then. But I will tell you that for many years as a child and adolescent, I was bitter for having been born in Mexico. I spent a great amount of time running from this core identity because I was ashamed, scared, and exhausted from what that meant for my own life. Growing up and having to go through immigration, having to stand in front of buildings to form lines before the sun was even out was exhausting. To be made fun of by Mexican peers who were born in the United States was not fun. People of color internalize this white system that makes it hard for people of color. Kids used to talk often about hospitals they were born in, and I grew up lying, saying that I was born in a hospital in San Diego. I wanted to be able to claim that just as the siblings after me. And having the lightest skin in my family, and after years of jokes that I was adopted, made it easier to get away with that. I used that as a way to run away from my own color. I had the privilege of learning English at a young age, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> By second grade, I mastered the English word wheel in our class, and I got a praise from Mr. Leavenworth at Mary Curie Elementary School in San Diego. I am a woman in between borders who has never fully felt from either place or from any place, despite being in different places authentically for a number of years. My people see me from here, and the system here has seen me from there. The past few weeks get to be added to the immigration process as a whole that I've been through. I received permission to be here at 14 years old via a green card that was given to me. That was when my mother also obtained her green card, making us permanent residents. I have to tell you that they messed up our ages, and they put that I was 35 and she was 14. It's not shocking anymore to me. More work for us because of their incompetence. In my early 20s, I then applied to become a citizen through marriage. I went through the whole process for that. I studied for the civics test and I passed it. I was waiting for the note in the mail letting me know when my ceremony to take my US citizenship oath would be. Instead though, I received a letter telling me that I was denied because I was already a citizen from the age of 14 when I got my green card. I had the unknown privilege of earning citizenship through the Citizenship Act of 2000. I've never taken an oath. This act is for those children who were under 18 at the time when one of their parents became a citizen. My father became naturalized in 1999. However, he was not notified of this. So for most of my life until that note, all I knew was that I was a legal alien or permanent resident that was the lightest in my family and could pass as really from here most of the time that I never felt permission to really touch this land and call it my own until the other day. About five weeks ago at work, I received an email stating that I had finished my training and was ready to go to Texas for further training 
at the Boy Scouts of America National Headquarters. I immediately remembered that my license needed renewal by June 14th, this past Wednesday, which happens to be, was my birthday, I turned 31, it happens to be number 45's birthday and flag day. The following day I went to try to renew it after I found out about the training. Everything seemed fine, including the reminder that I needed to get glasses. The lady behind the desk at the BMV was processing my application and then, and then asked me for my green card. A green card then expired. Expired because why should I have renewed it if I'm no longer a resident but a citizen? Well, I will need your proof of status now, a passport or a certificate of citizenship. I tried, find, I tried to find ways to extend my license, and I was told that a USCIS receipt within the last 60 days would extend it for a year. I took myself immediately, beginning to feel very afraid and crying to the USCIS office downtown. I have always been afraid of crossing back into these offices. There, I mentioned my situation, and I was told there is no temporary proof of citizenship this is also not an immigration issue. You will need to file for your certificate of citizenship. So I contacted lawyers to seek advice, and I knew a passport route was the quickest and easiest way, and the lawyer's advice the same. One can prove citizenship through the naturalization of a parent by bringing in different forms. So I prepared myself for a trip to Chicago's passport agency where I could obtain my passport the same day gathered translations of my birth certificate, my parents' marriage certificate, and brought a copy of my green card and my expired Mexican passport and my father's naturalization certificate, original. I also brought in an itinerary for international travel, which is required there for them to serve you, and I went hopeful. I was denied. When I left, I began to cry, and I voiced out loud that I just want to be able to claim a home, fully. I was shocked to hear myself say, I have felt homeless my whole life. And I felt those words in every part of my body as I shook. And to be precise, I was denied three times. So I drove there two more times. And communication about what it was I needed every time was confusing and frustrating. First, I needed proof that I was under my dad's custody. Had my father known this before I turned 18, it would have been easier for him to have applied for me than it was for me to be doing this at 30. I spoke to several specialists about what exactly they wanted so I could bring that next time and be good to go. They questioned my translations, but they didn't tell me there was a problem with them. So I came back to Indianapolis, sought out the proof of being under my dad's custody after 1999, ordered school records from every high school, brought in tax papers, you name it, a crossing back experience. I returned a week later after paying a lot of money and spending a lot of time obtaining these records quickly. I arrived and then my translations were not accepted, despite being from IUPUI and notarized due to missing a letterhead. Now, and here's, so this is a picture of me. This is how you walk into the passport agency. There you go, Chicago passport agency. <clears throat> I returned a week later. Okay, now they communicated this clearly. So again, specialist. I stayed overnight and I missed an important work meeting. I would retranslated my forms in Chicago and I went ahead and got a new copy of my birth certificate and got that retranslated as well. $200 in translations for two pieces of paper and lots of parking costs. On my third visit, I, asked why my trans I was asked why my translations were not stapled to the originals. I felt weak at the knees. I looked at this other specialist and told her that I did not let them staple them onto the documents because some of them weren't in good condition. I asked if they would be accepted that way, and she said yes, hesitantly which is why on the fourth visit I had a stapler in my car, <laughs> just in case. I was sent back to another specialist and then was asked for proof of being in my father's custody from birth to five years of age. Because now that my translations had been accepted and looked at and recognized, a problem arose. My birth certificate was not registered until a year after I was born. Baptism record? I responded, 
You guys asked me to collect information after 1995, 1999 specifically. I have a bap baptism record that my mom sent, but I was baptized after five. Kindergarten record? I didn't collect this, but I also didn't go to kindergarten. I began school in first grade. I had some paperwork that was from the age of six, but it wasn't enough. I had taxes from the age of five, but they weren't good enough despite having my name, my parents' name, and address, despite being able to piece it all together with every other paper I had that would have been impossible for that to have been made up. There's no social security number for you on the taxes. Why not? My response, I didn't have one, I guess, due to my status. Why did your sibling? I said, because they were born here and you automatically get one. Duh. <laughs> that whole experience was exhausting. With this being closer and closer to my deadline of renewing my license, I begged for answers for direction as to what to bring the next time that would satisfy their request. It was hard work to obtain a printout mentioning what kind of records would be good, along with the option of a paternity test. I opted for the paternity test because it was too hard to try to obtain records in a short amount of time, and I was so exhausted. I was even asked for prenatal records, as if those would be easy to obtain. I tried to call the clinic where I was born. I couldn't even get through. During this time, I was also asked several times why I was wearing a headscarf on my license. Is it for religious purposes? I said yes. And then I was asked, why did you take it off? That didn't sit well with me because it wasn't any of their business. Did you recognize me or not? What I can tell you is that I felt, I felt damned if I did and damned if I didn't. And that's when I let Congressman Andre Creston know this, and he told me that it wasn't right. So I set up a paternity test for my father in California, and to save $200, I drove to Lombard, Illinois, to get a swab. By the way, the DNA testing facility said that they did need to treat this as an immigration case in order for the results to be sent to the office sealed, in order for them to be accepted. Remember the USCIS person here who told me it was not an immigration issue. It cost me more for that very reason. There, I decided to stop by the Mexican consulate again and just get my passport, my Mexican passport, renewed. I found it funny that before I went into, when I was turning on to the DNA testing lab's place, this was the name of the street, Springer Drive. I was like, this really does feel like Jerry Springer. I'm just saying. I mean, it really did. <laughs> Within 15 minutes at the Mexican consulate, here's another picture, independent forensics, and here's the Mexican consulate in Chicago. So within 15 minutes there, I obtained my Mexican passport and a Mexican ID card. I obtained these out of fear that my license would expire, causing me another problem with the passport agency. But I was amazed at how easy it was to walk into my own government's office and be recognized and be seen. I was treated with every kind of respect and kindness, and I felt at home. I cried and laughed with my parents as we waited for the results of the paternity test. I told them that all of those jokes about my lighter skin were no longer funny. I asked them if it was possible I was swapped at birth. They laughed. I wasn't laughing. And yeah, finally I got confirmation from the DNA lab that my results were shipped to the Chicago Passport Agency and I was given a tracking confirmation. I was back on my birthday because the day before and the day before I was too busy trying to send my kid off to Germany and that flight had been messed up. Their dad was in, his dad was in Germany, but he wasn't. So I went back on that day of my birthday, which also happens again to be Trump's birthday. To make this story short, I was told to return at three to pick up my passport, but I did not believe that I would get it until I had it in my hand. Um, the day after I went to the Mexican consulate, when I got my passport, I was taking pictures right outside the Mexican consulate. There's a man, a Mexican man who had his business. He had churros and all sorts of other snacks. He, he stopped me and he told me, don't take a picture in Spanish. And I said, okay. When I got out and had my passport in my hands, I, I apologized to him and I said, thank you for letting me know that you don't want a picture taken. 
This was with his permission for me to share the churros because I ended up buying churros from him. But we had a really beautiful conversation about how he doesn't feel respected by people who walk the streets, that he has a right to his own privacy. And it was honestly very life-altering. And that was part of that whole crossing back experience that I had things to learn and appreciate from my own people as well. This is me when we returned on my birthday. My youngest, Zaki, since he's my child left behind, not going to Germany, he said, let's buy frappes for your birthday with my money. <laughs> this, is, this is the passport, Chicago passport office where we turned. I was appointment number 45. And they never did call me as appointment number 45. They called me by my name. I just, you're not allowed to take pictures, but I took it. <laughs> I got my passport that day. And I, you know, before I got it, we went into a cafe and I lost it just from the, just from the hope that I was possibly going to have it. So when I got out, I told Zaki, I'm like, please, let's take a picture right here with both of them because I can now say I'm a dual citizen. Of course, he's like, well, how do I become a dual citizen? I'm like, well, it's going to be a little harder for you. So I found it funny that me, you know, and Mr. President share a similar birthday. Um, I felt like I was going crazy, like the, the opening words say, me están volviendo loca, they're driving me crazy, they're turning me crazy. After we left, we drove around because I was determined I was going to take a picture because I'm all about now building beloved community and letting the voice be free. So this isn't really to do any bashing at all. I genuinely wanted to celebrate our birthdays. I drove by this place where a restaurant, as I was trying to find a parking spot that said, tu casa, su casa, which was very meaningful to me because in that moment, I finally felt like I could finally be able to say, this is my home and you have no way to take it away from me. No excuses from this point on. So I did our first Lyft ride, because Zaki's so much more advanced. He's like, we're not taking the bus, we're going to take Lyft. I think it was Uber. And we did that. <laughs> we went to the Trump International Hotel and Tower. I have both of my passports in my hand with a Mexican flag, because it's my citizenship as well. And I'm all about building, breaking down the walls and building beloved community. And we had, I think, a Trump supporter take our picture, because right after this, he said, will you take a picture of me with the Trump Tower? And I said, sure. And Zaki said, I don't think he knows that, you know, that our, you know, our opinions. And I said, it doesn't matter. Like, this isn't anything except to get the point across that we're here to build beloved community. Other people's opinions really don't matter. And we ended that day with pizza. <laughs> and... I share this story with you because this is just another experience of being Latina, of being Mexican in the United States. I have unique experience as a first generation who has been kind of stuck between borders. I have children who are half Mexican and part Palestinian. This experience allowed me to admit to myself things I have never allowed myself to say before. I could easily stand at Black Lives Matter events, but not at immigration events. I am now able to prove my dual citizenship, and it is the silver lining behind all of this. But it's my silver lining. Not the silver lining of the many people who are currently afraid. There are parents who are afraid to go grocery shopping, who aren't renewing their children's Medicaid out of fear. There is a lot of hiding and potential that isn't being shared with this world right now because this is what immigrant fear looks like. And I cannot be silent anymore, and I do intend to show up and use my story as a way to continue to do my own border crossing and crossing back, no longer afraid to own that I was born in Tijuana, Mexico, no longer afraid to even be on a camera or to say things about the system that need changing. Others deserve that as well. You know, I thought that part of the, like, I blamed bullying 
for all of my reasons to be afraid of the camera, and I've shared this in this congregation. And the past few months have been quite profound in showing me that it hasn't just been bullying, but it really has been an identity crisis where I was not allowed to fully embrace myself as I am. And so I did my, face, my first Facebook Live at the Trump Tower, and I turned the camera towards me for the first time. And I got into a bit of an argument with a coworker who's Mexican, and I said, you know, this country, I said something like, this country sucks or something, and she's like, don't say that. And for the first time, I felt like, you know what, I'm not going to get in trouble for being human. I'm still working my way around how to speak. I still have things to learn. I still have my own issues where I am blind as well. I don't see what people see. I haven't experienced those things. I'm even working on my language, right? I say guys all the time. I'm, I'm not myself very inclusive when I speak. I have a lot to learn. I also learned that I'm not the only one who goes through these who goes through these things. I learned through a lawyer that, you know, there was a man who needed to renew his license but lost his birth certificate, a white man. And he didn't have two forms of ID. So he couldn't. He was lucky that his mother, 95 years old, was still alive. Or otherwise the process would have been quite difficult for him. But still, it is harder for people of color, for Latinos. Now, blacks have the privilege of being able to show citizenship. Africans, not so much. Immigrants from other countries in this situation, no. You know, I was told at General Assembly last year, Elizabeth, you're here to be a cultural translator. And I didn't really know what that meant. I thought I did. I thought I got it until this past year when I realized this is actually what makes me a cultural translator, being in between borders. So, friends, I ask that you recall your own border crossing and all the spaces that you've also been brave enough to cross into. It's not comfortable. It has been scary for me to be a part of like the Muslim Jewish Women's Alliance group because of my own theological changes as a woman who still identifies as Muslim. It's difficult but I'm going to tell myself the words by Adet. Quote, but remember this, tired as you are, you are not alone. Here and here and here also, there are others weeping and rising and gathering their courage. You belong to them and they to you. And together we will break through and bend the arc of justice all the way down into our lives. Will you join me for our final hymn? (laughs) Thank you. We'll build a land Number 121, verses 1, 2, and 4.